This game just crossed its 10 year anniversary, which means it's now been available to freely play for as long as it's spent in development. That's a 10 year dev cycle in an environment where just a couple months is considered a long stretch. This game featured a minor antagonist from the Double Dragon series as our muscular, shirtless, orange skinned, thick mustached leading man. Although the mustache is in the eye of the beholder. It was a project that aimed to serve as both a parody of the 8-bit era, but also as the dream game of every kid who grew up playing the Nintendo Entertainment System, in a medium that often promotes shorter, time-killing experiences with a simple hook or premise. This is a full-blown game offered entirely for free. Despite a difficult development history, this gem, crafted by a supergroup in the indie Flash world, was the love letter millions of fans didn't even know they wanted, and has been heralded as the ultimate tribute to the NES. This is A Bobo's Big Adventure. How's it going everyone? Welcome to Two Left Thumbs. My name is Graham and this is Flashlight, the series where I talk about all things Flash related. A prominent Flash title packed to the gills with references centered around Newgrounds culture and celebrating a significant anniversary? I'm not sure if a video has ever been more in my wheelhouse. Coming off of a four hour live stream, celebrating the 10th anniversary of a Bobo's big adventure with the developers of the game, I'm here to look at it from a different angle. I want this to feel like a mini documentary, going in depth on what it took to get this game made, the hype surrounding it, the impact it had, and the legacy that's followed those 10 years since. And yes, as the developers revealed in that stream, there was a time where they tossed around the idea of doing a Bobo's super adventure. So this video will actually be a first time ever exclusive look at that. I'm so excited to be the one to get to share this exciting look at the sequel that never was. A Bobo's Big Adventure is a mashup that ties together the characters, levels, designs, mechanics, and genres of pretty well every popular NES game out there, as well as plenty of others that were simply well loved by the developers. I would challenge anyone to try to identify all the references in this game. People have said I should do like a finding the references style video on a Bobo. I think that would take 10 years to put together. Even the name, A Bobo's Big Adventure, is an homage to the movie Pee Wee's Big Adventure, one of Roger's all time favorites. Heck, this game went far enough that it intentionally included infamous bugs and glitches from the games that inspired it, taking those moments longtime fans remember and twisting them in an unexpected way for the sake of an all new gag, to simply remain accurate to the source, or to seek out potential for yet another tribute and reference. This team made this game from a place of love as fans first, imbuing this adventure with everything they know and love about the NES. Yeah, I was born in 1980, so about 80 the NES was made and that's you know my childhood is built around the Nintendo Entertainment System <laughs> and uh, I'm from the mid 70s I actually grew up uh, on the Intellivision then the Nintendo came around and saved the video game industry basically Nintendo Entertainment System I absolutely adored it uh, Super Mario Brothers 2 when that came out that was like at the peak of my Nintendo fandom and uh, I mean I grew up on this stuff so it's that's why this is like this long labor of love for guys like us we grew up on these things I'll be sure to use a few snippets from this old video game museum interview, as it's so fun to see and hear Nick and Roger's excitement talking about a Bobo shortly after its release. I'll link to that video down below. While you're down in the description, I can point you in the direction of two other important links. First off, there is a Newgrounds hosted a Bobo art contest running now through to February 11th. There are cash prizes to be won, a stuffed Domo-kun that carries its own fun history, as well as these a Bobo coins. They were created to give to anyone who beat the full game at their Comic Con booth 10 years ago, and these are the last three in existence. And one more quick but important thing before going deeper into everything, you'll see a donation link down in that description. To this day, due to the obvious copyright issues that permeate this game, they've never been able to sell copies of it. And while Newgrounds sponsored their work, which definitely wouldn't have accounted for the insane hours that went into it, pretty well any money earned from the game has primarily come from that donation link on the official Abobo website. Roger shared that donations still come in to this day. And while they've always been far, far from making a living off these small contributions, they go a long way to allowing these developers to continue doing what they love 
and allowing us to support them in the amazing work they created. So definitely check those out. The art contest is already bringing out some amazing results, and I hope you consider showing these guys some love and kicking what you're able to their way. Abobo's big adventure comes from the collaborative efforts of Nick Pasto, Pox Power, with contributions from Jack Smack, all spearheaded by iMockery's Roger Barr. Calling this a supergroup almost undersells it. At the time, each of these devs was less well known than they are now, but looking back, it's a wild team. Nick, who primarily went by Bomb Tunes at the time and now Pesto Force, is a programmer known for Castle Crashing the Beard, Portal Defenders, Deterministic Dungeon, and Super Chibi Knight. Pox, who has his own site, The Pox Box, and is a pixel art wizard, is known for his work on Territory War Online, Cult Classic, and more recently, the wildly successful pair of Soda Dungeon games. Roger Barr, creator of iMockery, is an internet icon who has been around almost as long as Newgrounds. Uh, it's funny though, Tom Folk and I both went to the same school in Philadelphia at slightly different years, but we never knew each other there. It was afterwards that we met up just online. Known as a horror enthusiast, author, comic creator, and game designer. Hell, this guy went on a comedy tour with YouTube powerhouse Nathan Barnett, in character as Keith Apicary, 10 years ago around the height of his popularity. Nowadays, he's working with Cyanide and Happiness to bring their Freak Apocalypse game series to life. It's hard to properly list off all of Roger's credits because he's sort of been involved in a little bit of everything. We also had contributions from a few other people, mostly from within Newgrounds, including Jack Smack, who took on the programming of one of the levels himself. This powerhouse team took Roger's dream project and made it a reality. I don't mean to make it sound like this game was willed into existence. I don't think anyone would believe that. Games don't take 10 years to make because everything was easy peasy, yet somehow this team was able to support one another, persevere, and create what is the definitive Flash game for many. And thanks to the Ruffle Flash emulator, watch my video on Flash preservation for more specifics on that, this game still plays directly in your browser. That could be on their official site. If you stop by there, maybe you also toss in a donation, because by God, God, they deserve it, or on Newgrounds if you want to try to earn some very difficult medals. Nick Pasto shared a childhood memory of his first time ever seeing a Bobo in the Double Dragon Arcade. That moment I clearly remember when I was about seven seeing for the first time in a pizza parlor in my old hometown one night at a little league end of season celebration, seared forever into my brain pan. This was the first ever appearance of a Bobo in a video game. So what is a Bobo's Big Adventure? I want to get into the meat of things by looking at the actual adventure. And maybe an immediate question to start off with is, why a Bobo? Simply put, Roger loves the unsung characters of any game and felt a particular fondness for a Bobo, listing him as his favorite NES character. Basically, uh, a Bobo was from Double Dragon. He's the angriest looking character anybody's ever seen. He was huge in that game and scared the crap out of everybody. Wondered what, where did he come from? What's his backstory? And f unfortunately, we couldn't find it, so we had to make it up. He also shared in that live stream that if this project were to have starred anyone other than a Bobo, it would have been Karnov. Coincidentally, another muscly orange character with a mustache. I guess Roger has a type? The only one I actually almost thought about making a game about him instead of a Bobo. That's a fun fact for you, because I always loved Karnov. I just thought he was like this underrated thing, but Karnov already had his own game. Karnov still managed to make his way into this game. Booting this up for the first time, waiting for things to load, you can feel your heart swell. They had a fun little animation, as a Bobo picks up an NES cartridge, tries to get the game started, gives it a blow, and boots it up for this incredible experience. Roger shared this spectacular mock-up of what he wanted this preloader screen to look like. Programmer art at its finest. While nowadays our internet connections are too fast, and we can only really appreciate this through video archives, but it's one of a thousand ways that this game instantly starts with its celebration of all things NES. You can even start duck hunting before the menu pops up. And it features what is the only piece of original music composed for this game, written by Roger himself. 
giving the game that extra bit of prestige and solidifying that this is a Bobo's game. As another behind the scenes exclusive detail for this video, Roger actually shared the original version of this track, showing how that song eventually progressed. I'll play the original and then the one you know from the game. The big adventure itself kicks off with the kidnapping of the original character of a Bobo's son, who they dubbed a Boboy. What is a Bobo to do? Go on a murderous rampage, of course, ripping every recognizable NES character, and all the obscure ones as well, to absolute shreds. Through eight unique worlds themed around different games and genres of that era. This all fittingly starts out in a double dragon level. Did I mention each level gets a Boboified name? Because they do, and I absolutely love it. You move from Double Drobobo to Super Mabobo, the often maligned water level. The developers had some split opinions on that during the stream. It's just a common thing in video games for people to hate on water levels. I'm curious from each of you, do you guys like or hate water levels? Go I've never met a water level, level I like except for you know, Bobo's Big Adventure. I think, yeah, yeah, it's pretty brutal and the Bobo is really big and clunky too for that level. <laughs> And I think the Flash version would lag a little bit sometimes too, so it just would be so annoying, especially with the purple, like, like stuff that shocks you. Like definitely the most annoying level for me. Uh, uh, hold up, not me. I am actually, I am a fan of water levels, which is why we have the water okay. level in the game. I love games that are extremely hard, for one thing, and uh, I always love the music in the Mario level, because honestly, in, in Super Mario Brothers, like, that was the exciting level for me. That was the level that changed things up. Like the rest of the game is kind of the same all throughout, but the water level was like, oh, this is different. I actually had made an animation of a Bobo doing this like stupid Mario swimming motion and it looked horrible. And thankfully Pox re redrew it as to something much, much nicer for us. I just thought that was too fun of an anecdote to leave out. And it informs a lot about the difficulty of this game. Next up is the transitional level, Urban Jabobo, that you actually can't lose. Nick, let him punch you. It has that little dink sound. That was a joke I wanted in there so bad. This guy can't even hurt a bobo. There's no way to lose this. And he'll pause and act like he's doing well and all <laughs> just like he would in a real game. Then followed by Zelda Bobo, which is by far the longest of the levels. A combination balloon a bobo and pro a bobo level. It took like six takes to say that correctly. All these bobos are turning into a tongue twister. Rounding things off with Mega Mabobo, which is the one programmed by Jack Smack. This was, was one of the earliest bobo. ideas I had for a bobo was uh, putting him in the uh, Mega Mac costume. Carrying on with more platforming through Contra Bobo. This one could almost count as two levels as well, seeing as there's both the horizontal and vertical vertical sections, and a final fight against Little Mac in Punchabobo. Each level is packed with references, enemies, secrets, and more, all capped off with their own big and challenging boss battles that put a fun twist on the games that these levels are riffing on. You fight Robobobo, the most fun boss name of all time, a giant version of Zelda's old man, or Kirby climbing into a giant crane. There are so many careful considerations, love, and attention that went into each and every one of these levels. They only rarely went against the norms of these games Games when they felt they could improve the user experience. Curious might notice is that it's slightly nerfed. It's a little bit easier than the original version. So as hard as the stage is, if anyone wants to go back and play the real Mega Man 2 Quick Man level, it's even faster. So yeah, it's way easier in our version compared with the original NES game. The original spread gun in Contra was glitchy because you could only have a certain number of sprites on the screen at the same time. Ours is accurate. Like it's the it's a better spread gun than the original. <laughs> it's the way it should have worked in the original. First mentioned on that stream and. Then 
then expanded on shortly after on the official Newgrounds podcast. Roger explained how the first thing he ever did for this game was the animation of a Bobo carrying Doc Lewis. I'll include a link to the Newgrounds podcast down below. It's about two and a half hours and is also worth a listen. That animation of the training sequence with Doc Lewis was the very first thing I ever made for Bobo's Big Adventure. It was just this little animation joke that I was going to throw up on Newgrounds about how a Bobo trains differently than Little Matt. When I did that, I was like, oh, maybe I could make a game out of a Bobo, and that, that's where it kind of took off from him. Roger's first ever contributions to Newgrounds are these small video game parody projects, and this one started out equally small. Through this, he always knew that a final showdown against Little Mac would be the conclusion. That's all that was ever going to be. It was just going to be this silly little flash animation that just popped in my head. That's what Newgrounds was great for. It's just you would come up with a silly idea, whether it's killing the old man or who, who knew that it would turn into a 10 year game project instead. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> One of the biggest questions I had, and I'm sure many others would, is what would have been the next on their list of game or genre homages if there had been one more level before this finale? Metroidvania, probably. I'm a huge fan of the Castlevania games, uh, you know, obviously from, from making the old Priest Battle game on new grounds. And, and we do have plenty of Castlevania references in the game and all, but I really did want a, uh, you know, a, <laughs> a Bo Belmont uh, <laughs> stage. If we ever do more Bobo in the future sometime, uh, who knows, maybe we can do something with that. But Castlevania was, was right at the top uh, of my list of games that we didn't get to do a stage for, but Ninja Gaiden was, was right up there as well. And man, and the, was that a fantastic game. The game over screen in a Bobo's Big Adventure is a spoof on the, the arcade arcade, arcade yeah. version of Ninja Gaiden where there's a big a saw coming down to chop your character if you don't <laughs> yeah, uh, put, in, need... put in another quarter. <laughs> At one point the team planned to have unique heads up displays for each world but decided to unify the worlds and make it clear this is a Bobo's game start to finish as well as simplifying things for the player. Although this didn't stop them from ensuring each world had as many unique flares as possible. In addition to unique themes, mechanics, and sprite work, there are unique themed rage moves that have a Bobo lashing out with devastating, bloodlust-fueled special attacks that lay waste to everything on screen. This carries through to moments like animated game over screen having their own little tributes, like a Bobo barely fitting on the punch-out stool. If you pay attention, there's even minor details, like each pause screen having a sound effect tied to that original game. You may have noticed there was no pause screen for Urban Chabobo, and as the other developers were quick to point out and tease him over, this is the only level credited as being programmed by Pox, and he didn't know how to make a pause function. The main reason we adhered to the eight stages was because we wanted to use the Mega Man stage select screen on our exactly. level select. Because uh, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. if it were not for that, I, I probably would have, uh, you know, talked the, these two guys into making even even more stages but that Mega Man screen that's that's just as iconic as anything to me and Me Mega Man 2 was one of my favorite NES games for sure uh, so uh, I, I love the idea of, of having that as our as our stage select and, and not going outside the bounds of that. There's not a single corner of this game that doesn't have something new and exciting to discover. The whole team absolutely loves watching anyone enjoy this game appreciating all those little moments and details they put in. We've talked about one of our favorite dreams of, of all of them is uh, from Far From Subtle, awesome video games slash video games awesome group. And they would all sit on a couch and they grew up in the same era as us. So they were huge Nintendo Entertainment System fans. So getting to see them play through the entire game over the course of like, I think it was like 12 videos or something and just freaking out over all the main moments that we wanted to land, uh, all those really big fun moments. Um, I think that that is my my favorite of the, the streams. It's so I'll never forget the video games awesome seeing them all scream and use the it's the power! 
power glove and just that that's one of those things again i just i've rewatched that over the years many many times in addition to having endless nes references across every single frame the devs couldn't help but tie in as many non-gaming passions and pop culture references as they could we fight against bubba hanks from forrest gump navin johnson from steve martin's the jerk this cut scene pays tribute to an opening sequence from the old rambo cartoon with a weird al reference laced on top of that one and one of my personal favorites is this parade of pro wrestlers roger even shared on stream that each team member submitted which wrestler they wanted included in this scene with pox then hand animating each of their unique real world finishing moves this game couldn't even let up by the end credits finding room for additional references and gags including numerous characters who never appeared in the game recreating one of Roger's all-time favorite credit sequences in Super Mario Bros. 2. Perfectly recreating that style, having Pox hand draw unique bits of art to go with every included character. Leaving it all off with the 80s mantra, Goonies never say die. There's not a single wasted moment across this entire experience. A Bobo's big adventure is a challenge, staying true to its roots. Rather, anecdotally, it sounds like most players who grew up playing these original NES titles typically fare better. And talking to many different people, I was maybe just kind of notably bad at the game. But one of the team's goals with this big adventure was to show how fun classic games can be, and hopefully encourage players to seek out and play the game Games it pays homage to. On stream, plenty of people shared their stories. Anyone who has ever played this game likely has a few standout memories, with the finale being something rather unforgettable. One of the things we wanted to do after people going through all of this was have an ending like none you had ever seen before. If there's anything a, a lot of people who play classic NES games remember, it's that some of them took a tremendous amount of effort and the payoff at the end was not always great. Like I remember playing um, Commando and it just said like, good job or something like that at the end and wanted to have an ending for the record books. It keeps going and going. Roger shared that he animated this segment himself and that he knew he wanted to end the game off with a bang. And with the game being developed quite linearly, this is one of the last things he did for the game, allowing it to be a capper for both the player and for himself wrapping up production. And with the finale of a Bobo and a Bow Boy ripping the crowd to bits, Roger and Nick teased Pox for or originally drawing them as regular human beings. You can even see the sprites of the crowd cheering on the two Abobos still look rather humanoid. That part was never changed. While it's gratuitous as is, they felt it bordered on uncomfortable when presented that way, and realized they could instead carry on the game's basis of beating other franchise protagonists to a pulp. Here I have an exclusive look of the original Human Slaughter version of this ending. Yeah, I'd say the tone of that ending is a little different. There is so much to appreciate in this game that you could watch this documentary, play the game for yourself, watch that playthrough Roger recommends, and watch the four hour live stream, and potentially still not have covered everything it has to offer. There are just so many different angles and means through which to appreciate this insane project. I recommend you challenge yourself on new grounds and work to unlock all 100 medals, including many tests of your skills and secrets to be found along the way. After playing through that main game, there's also an unlockable minigame, Luck Dragon Lunacy. And I believe Pox coded this as well. Yeah. Yes, he did. Why did we make this again? <laughs> Why does this exist? Because it needed to. 
because nobody else would. A short 60 second challenge riding on the back of Falcor from Never Ending Story. You earn points and build up speed by smashing through enemies, eventually unlocking the ultimate rad-tacular Abo Boaster, a digital copy of an Abobo promo poster that was hand-drawn by Pox. Beating the game also allows you to play the two-player Abobo battle mode based on Double Dragon's battle mode, duking it out with seven possible arenas, playing as four unique abobos. That's not even the only multiplayer option. In the Contra level, the Konami code can be entered upon dying to give you 30 lives, but if you enter it while still alive, you unlock a two-player mode for that one level, allowing a second player to play as an equivalent to Contra's Lance Bean, dubbed by this team as a bow bro. That's one of my most fond memories is I have a, a cousin that we would play two-player Contra like all the time, just whenever we got together, it was like our way of spending time together. And so so it was a big nostalgia for me to have two-player mode on, on that level. Having this singular level be the place where you can experience the game in a two-player fashion is in one way a limitation of this massive development process, but another way to look at it is yet another above and beyond tribute to the way these developers remember playing Contra. As the team discussed on that Newgrounds podcast, how do you ever determine when a game of this size is complete? I mean, after after a certain point, it just you can tell we had something really good going, and no matter how long it was going to take, we didn't have any deadline and stuff. So, uh, and I think after all the work we had already put in at that point, it was just like we're just going to keep making this un until we think it's ready. It's going to be worth it in the end, and and it was. It, it really was. And something that goes beyond an already jam-packed game that I'll save for you to discover all on your own, acquired by donating to the Abobo team, is a Bo Boy's Small Adventure. This is an entirely original creation based on that original character of a Bo Boy. This little guy just wants to give out hugs, but destroys everything along the way, like father, like son. The entire universe has teamed up against him, throwing everything his way while you fight to survive. It's a bonus game that's more complex than many Flash games, and it's an added benefit that makes this project all the more worth supporting. We cared so much at the end and like we even uh, you know made this extra mini game a bow boys small adventure and that was just something that we did right at the end of it it just showed like how much we we cared about this project there were just so many ideas that i still would have loved to keep adding in but at some point you have to say like okay, no, this <laughs> <laughs> this is good enough. Like, uh, you, you know there's a cutoff point, but it, it did take 10 years for us to be like, all right, now's the cutoff point. How do you bring a massive project like this to life? Maybe you still fail to see how it took 10 years, besides the fact that it was made for free in everyone's spare time. Mockery started work on a Bobo back in 2002, planning on it being his first full-length Flash game following those few parodies and short projects. Roger actually dug up that original build that ends at the first stage boss, so I'd be able to show off what the game looked like in that original state. This 2002 version was created with Roger's friend and collaborator, Bane. Their most well-known project together was Pickle Man and the Green Thumb of Triumph or just Pickle Man's Green Thumb as it's listed on Newgrounds, which also featured artwork by Pox. A Bobo was continually sidetracked with Mockery and Bane each working on other projects, which was when Mockery and Tom Fulp made Domo-kun's Angry Smash Fest, a game Roger described on his own forum as basically a fancier version of what the original A Bobo parody was going to be. To put this timeline in perspective, that project will hit its 20th anniversary at the end of the year. I love the fact that the Doc Lewis training sequence from Punch-Out made its way into that game as well. And in an incredible bit of serendipity, Nick shared during that live stream the way this game influenced him. Before I even laid my first line of code in Flash, I played Domo Kun's Angry Smash Fest, and I was just like, whoa. I didn't know this was possible in a, in a web browser. Like, this feels like an arcade game. So later on, when Roger reached out to me and I was like, whoa, the creator of Domo Kun <laughs> is like wanting to work with me i was like starstruck you know like i was like heck yeah i'll learn whatever i need to learn <laughs> like just 
you know, count me in. That original 2002 version of a Bobo was eventually scrapped, as Mockery was unhappy with it, stating, I didn't like how the demo was turning out, because a lot of his code made the game stray too far from a genuine NES feeling. It was just one of those projects that just ended up just kind of lingering and just dying off for a while. But then Nick and Pox joined me, and uh, they both actually cared about those kind of details. That's when, you know, I got to uh, really dial up the uh, madness uh, with these two uh, the, the way I wanted. After the release of a Bobo, Nick also wrote up a detailed post-mortem, which I'll lace in bits of to highlight a second perspective and look back on the making of this behemoth of a game. Wait, sorry, this massive monster of a game. Damn, that doesn't work either. This hunky, muscly, mustached man-beast of a game. I don't think that uh, studio exists yet. He didn't know if he necessarily had the chops to pull it off, but he shared, I immediately accepted without realizing what I was getting into. That was in 2007. Roger decided to pick back up the project. He put out an APB on Newgrounds, and I submitted what I was working on at the time, him and Pox, the, the demo of the Zelda level from Boss Bash. And they liked that enough that they're like, all right, this guy has what it takes. So they brought me on board. And I was starstruck because Domo Kun was the game that blew the lid off of Flash for me, where I was like, oh, I didn't know this was possible to do in a web browser. Nick claims that his programming gets notably better as the game progresses, seeing as it was produced quite linearly. So he feels his least polished work is at the start and best is at the end. He debated going back and starting some of those early levels over, but I don't think anyone was prepared to delay the game any further. Back when Nick joined, the game was started over featuring himself and the artistic abilities of Pox, throwing out everything that came before, with their goal being to create the game any kid who grew up with the classic NES always dreamed of playing. Nick still jokes that with his own involvement in the game spanning more than four years, I think I deserve an honorary doctorate in a Bobo. The three grew comfortable working together, expressing their shared love of classic 8-bit games, and stuffing infinite gags and details into all their early projects, including Trick or Treat Adventure Quest, which itself was nominated for the 2008 New Grounds Tank Awards in the Best Game category. The shared humor and design sensibilities solidified their partnership and proved they were a force to be reckoned with. The eventual winner was Fancy Pants Adventures World 2, so the competition was rather stiff. Not to worry though, because a Bobo itself went on to win Game of the Year during the 2012 Tank Awards. Every member of the team continued to work on their own projects throughout, same as Roger and Bane had done back when they first started, but this was less about getting sidetracked and more about giving themselves a chance to come up for air. These guys shared a few times on call how much they miss the quick turnaround of one month developments for Flash games. That's as true now as it was back then, and they always enjoyed having the opportunity to work on things like Trick or Treat Adventure Quest together or various other games with other partners. Through that, they could all learn more along the way, building up their respective talents and fan bases while avoiding both burnout and any major internal conflicts that might have derailed the game. How many games do we know that have gone belly up due to creative differences? How many games do you know that spent four years with a core team of three people seeing it through to the end? There are still times when we'd laugh and think, you know, we could be using this time to make a game we could sell instead of just doing a parody game for free. But what can I tell you? It was a labor of love, and this game needed to exist as far as we were concerned. Nick details booting up various NES games and playing them over and over to nail down their unique and precise controls and feel. He was already familiar with many, but said ones like Balloon Fight were quite tricky to get right as he had never played that game prior to starting this development. The scope of the project quickly became apparent, with everyone being used to the speedy turnaround of Flash game cycles, where you work for two or three weeks and then get the rush of releasing something, around the halfway point after coding the massive Zelda level, the burnout was setting in. Often in Zelda, the maps would look like something, like they would look like a smiley face or a, a monster or something. That's right. The rocket ship. Oh, yeah. I'm curious if this level is longer than you intended because you guys were so committed to drawing out that picture, or if this is like pretty representative that, of like a typical... That is actually, like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this level did not need to be as long as it is. It's all because of that joke. Is it true you lost pretty much an entire year of development because of a dick joke? Is that true? That, I don't know how much time was lost on that, but no. just the, the length of the shaft required like 14 extra rooms. 
you gotta do a dick level, you gotta go big. Yeah. 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 So that was the stage that kind of broke Nick. Um, <laughs> yeah. To make this dick drawing, there's like 60 rooms. <laughs> yeah, but so it actually looks and, like and everyone agrees it was totally worth it. Nick began to worry that the game would never be completed, that he was putting this amount of time in a project that would never see the light of day. Each time he attempted to test run the game, it took minutes of compiling, when Flash games usually compile in about six seconds. At this midway funk, he actually didn't open any Abobo related files for over a year. I never admitted it openly to myself, but thoughts of just scrapping the project flitted through my mind pretty often during this time. I felt like a bobo had a death lock on my ankle and was dragging me down the deepest, darkest, underwater plumber's pipe ever constructed. I share this to remind people that anyone can feel crushed by the weight of their work, passion project or otherwise. Luckily, the team was very supportive, being rather ahead of their time in that regard, considering how much more normalized it is nowadays to talk about our mental health, especially as it relates to our work. Nick defined Pox's work ethic as inhuman, with most of the custom art and cutscenes already completed. Nick carried a lot of guilt as the game sat on the backburn, a story that's all too familiar to anyone who has worked on a voluntary group project. I have to thank Raj and Pox for sticking with me through my depressed times. Game development is far from easy, and it's awesome to hear how supportive these three were of each other. Being open and honest and looking out for yourself and each other is so damn important. While I hope anyone is inspired by this story and feels that they can take on the world and accomplish a project of this scale, please look after yourself through that duration. Looking at individual screens and moments from this game, it may be easy to discount Pox's contribution, thinking that the majority of the art was lifted from existing games. What even is there for an artist to do here? And while there is a lot of borrowed sprites, there is an insane amount of original work in this game that is almost entirely invisible because of how well it blends. In addition to the labor-intensive sprite ripping done to assemble this game, on stream, Roger detailed that Spriter resources for all these obscure games simply weren't available at the time. I think we used like an emulator to play through the games and just screenshot the sprites. We would have to like replay over and over and save like save states and do that kind of stuff until you get all the, the sheets. You all guys, the steps of the animation, yeah. There wasn't something like the Spriter's resource like there is now? Oh, yeah, you guys some were... had some of them, but not all of them. Oh my yeah, because we, we were doing some deep dives and this is like before a lot of that stuff, you know, really existed and all. So yeah, we had to do a lot of this by hand, just hand extracting stuff and it was painfully long, but you know, the, the work speaks for itself. In addition to that crazy workload, Pox had to alter the majority of the sprites to fit the game. Look at the original Double Dragon Abobo sprite sheet. That's not that large. Every other frame of this character we see was handcrafted and painted. By my count, this game had over 5,000 unique sprite frames, and about 900 of those specifically came from a Bobo. That's not even including the effects, the blood, and all the cutscene frames that also surround the character. Entirely in Photoshop, by the way. I mean, whatever works for him. There's obviously much more specific tools nowadays that some would argue are better, but I can't point to many pixel artists better than Pox, so I think he knows what he's doing. A Bobo has had to be reworked and redrawn over and over to fit each unique iteration and game style. Even levels like the Zelda one that look like they're taken straight out of a Zelda game couldn't just be lifted and ripped in a one-to-one -one fashion. They had to take individual assets and craft their own tile set and then recreate everything by hand. For sure, Pox drew more custom pixels, pixel for pixel, than the the stolen, or no, sorry, the uh He the said stolen. He said it. <laughs> Keep that in. Keep <laughs> isolate that, isolate that, we need that. Somebody edit that out. As a part of the distinct UI they chose, rather than simply slapping a sprite in the corner, Pox chose to create unique portraits for all of these characters in one unified style. When they shared that, it blew my mind. That's such an easily missed level of detail that wildly expanded the workload, but is one of the many things that ensure this game stands.
stands out. Not to mention the many handcrafted cutscenes that add to the story and cohesiveness of the adventure. So yes, the game uses existing sprites, but I want to make sure the work poured into the art and animations of this game is fully appreciated. Roger has referred to the development of this game numerous times as a stream of consciousness, putting in any and all ideas he could possibly think of. I wanted a character who was made of conveyor belts because that was always a Bobo's <laughs> biggest fear in the game. Like, that was the one way you could defeat him easily. And Nick was even like, how do you even make a character made of conveyor belts? That it was our whole development sense. process. Was, <laughs> yeah. Roger is a, is a largely verbal kind of joke maker. And so a lot of the stuff he would come up with, we'd just be like, what? How do we even <laughs> translate that into like, two dimensions? I mean, at least it's not three dimensions, but come on. While it was all a collaboration, it really was Roger's brainchild, with him always working to make the game bigger and better. While pretty much everything eventually passed through Roger and Nick's hands, it's easy to lose track of. Roger showed off these little zombies from Monster Party, which is a personal favorite of his, and Pox didn't even know that secret was there. There, At least there was a point where I knew 100% of everything, but after 10 years have passed, or 20 years really, uh, I, I probably have forgotten a few things. So I far, forgotten. so good. It's, so far it's so good. indelibly seared into my <laughs> brain through trauma. It's a payoff for challenging players to go against the conventions of a Mario game heading backwards through a level. If there was an opportunity for anything anywhere, they took it. Does anyone want to take credit for a Bobo rocket pooping his way out of that <laughs> leading into this area? <laughs> I think that was all of us for that one, right? We just, we knew uh, he, he, needed to, he needed to fall down somewhere, right? I think Abobo's Big Adventure is like part of the appeal of the humor is just, just surprise after surprise after surprise. Just when you think you've got the game figured out, it throws something new at you. And you're just pointing at the screen. You're like, I know that. And I know that. And I know that. And it just keeps coming at you. Yeah. Nick and Pox joked on that same test call about the feature creep of this game and that it likely never would have been finished if they hadn't learned to start saying no to some of Mockery's pitches to expand the game. Would any of us have taken on this parody project had we known it was going to take so many years to complete? I can only speak for myself, and even I'm not sure about it. Alongside that rebooted development many years ago, the opportunity was taken to give the game a more full story, as well as starting to outline how a Bobo would move from one game world to the next. The creation of the first level began with the devs playing old NES games in a hunt to decide which characters would be included. It wasn't enough to feature a couple characters to represent a given genre, this game had to be spilling over with references on every possible screen. For example, like on the uh, Super Mario 2 underwater level, right? You know, we could just throw anything in there uh, to, hey, remember this. But instead, we went through a, a ton of games that actually had underwater characters that would fit under there. You know, like Karnov, most people don't associate Karnov with, with swimming, but there is a stage in Karnov where he actually does swim. So we used those versions of Karnov Karnov's sprites to make that work down there. And He's a things, mermaid so. Karnov. Is exactly. Yeah. Murnov. Murnov. <laughs> you know. So that, that kind of stuff was, was important to us. And, and also, you know, having a real story with it, that is honestly what, what connects it. Because you, you can throw a million things together and just have people be like, oh yeah, I remember that. But we had a thread going through this whole game, the story of a Bobo trying to pursue whoever kidnapped his son, a Bobo. Like, so they're as cheesy as it sounds, there was like some actual drama, some heart beneath all of this craziness. So I think that's how you can, you know, do nostalgia right. In a hilarious bit of irony, Roger shared in an IGN interview ahead of release, there's no way this game could have ever fit on an NES cartridge, as we've crammed so much into it. So while many have had the dream of one day booting this up on their actual NES, it really wasn't meant to be. A Bobo's Big Adventure, we've had so many people ask us over the years since it came out, like, can you put this on an NES cartridge? It's like, no, the NES could never do that, but you still, <laughs> you still... You still want it to feel like it could. But as Nick showed on that stream, there are USB adapted NES controllers that allow you to experience the game as it was intended. There's a real sense of curation of knowledge of the source material and quintessential example of what we're talking about. The idea of mixing Kirby in where Krang goes on the yes. Krang Android body. <laughs> it's like, Krang -B. of course, yeah. of course, they're both pink. They're both about the same size. Yeah. And like, it's just like, uh, I don't know, you, you have to be, 
you have to be a person who grew up in in a certain era to, to even have that thought cross your mind. Development of a Bobo was bound to run long with no real end in sight. It can be an incredibly difficult thing to pour so much into a game without being able to share those results. San Diego Comic Con was a real game changer for these developers and an outlet to finally put their game in front of fans. In 2009, the first three levels and a few cutscenes were complete. Roger had covered Comic Con for many years years as a part of iMockery, and now had a booth for the very first time. A silly little image that I couldn't resist sharing. Roger had made these cutout pickle hats, and one year had the opportunity to interview Stan Lee, with him then asking for a pickle hat of his own. What a phenomenal picture. Roger apparently loves giving back to his fans any way he can. They paid out of pocket to bring these Abobo masks a different year to Comic Con. In its very first public appearance, Abobo Bobo's Big Adventure was presented for players with an NES controller, allowing anyone who stopped at their booth to experience the game the way they intended. While not everyone was up to the challenge, the game was a hit, with Nick jokingly telling me that most players thought this was a Double Dragon parody only, as they couldn't get past the TNC skater and never saw the other levels of the game. I used to play TNC Surf Designs, that was one of my favorite games, a lot of people may not remember, but you gotta have a reference into that. So. Bobo could beat the crap out of him. That particular encounter was heavily nerfed after Comic Con 09, as well as plenty of other bug fixes and improvements. While all of that feedback was invaluable, the main takeaway was seeing the excitement on players' faces as they immediately connected with a Bobo and saw it for the dream game the developers always intended. Nick especially was able to use Comic Con as a motivator. That yearly deadline helped me push myself to work more on the game so we'd have new stuff to show off every time. It also spurred me to do something I've always wanted to do, build an arcade cabinet that features a game I made. Nick, with the help of a few others, went above and beyond for their second year and created the now iconic Abobo arcade cabinet. His best friend, Matt Cochran, did the CAD design that allowed the arcade to exist in two parts a top and bottom that allowed it to be deconstructed and reconstructed, fitting in his car for transport, or set up as a full arcade setup, with his brother-in-law Darby helping out to build it. They hand cut the wood, assembled controllers and buttons from various sources, and had Jeff Bendelin, known as Johnny Utah on Newgrounds, the creator of the Tank Men series, draw up unique marquee art that decorated this cabinet. Nick shared in an old Newgrounds forum post the difficulties of crafting this cabinet. The main challenge we faced was building something that could collapse down into my trunk for transport. We decided to build it in two pieces so it could be a tabletop for limited booths space, and a full-size cabinet for my garage. The game was running through a laptop in a hidden drawer, displayed on an old monitor Nick scored on Craigslist for 40 bucks. But the illusion was complete. Add in a backlit marquee, a few devices for programmable inputs to feed into the laptop, include some finishing touches like an NES-inspired controller console. This is actually the, uh, the attract screen, which is something that old arcade game. Oh yeah. Did, so I haven't pushed push start yeah it would like show you some gameplay to try to get you to come over and drop some quarters in to start I, I think we're okay to put a quarter in and this thing was ready to present the allure of the cabinet was immediate and irresistible that drew in people like crazy and i printed up a giant a bobo standee that towered over everything at comic-con <laughs> it was it's great a, it just you could see it from a mile away over all of the other booths and everything players flocked over to see what this was all about with major sites like destructoid and many other gaming outlets writing stories about this passion project. In the years since, dedicated fans have created their very own Abobo arcades, creating this amazing full circle realization of these fan-made projects made for a love of the game, dedicated to a game that itself is the ultimate labor of love. We do provide the blueprints for the cabinet if anyone actually wants to take on the project. All they gotta do is email us. In addition to everything else learned in this time, Nick shared his newfound ability to ask for help. He was assisted by Newground's own Mike, who coincidentally is one of the brains behind Ruffle that has kept a Bobo and so many other games playable to this day. Mike pops up in many people's stories of like saving the day because he's like a genius mm -hmm. and he loves Newgrounds and he loves helping this community. Tom Pope uh, just chimed in, Mike is the ultimate human, uh, so uh, <laughs> there. 
from from the Flash Man himself. Mike taught Nick how to create the game in a piecemeal manner, level by level, only to be compiled into a complete game for larger finishing touches and testing. With the finish line in sight, Nick asked Jack Smack for help, who took on coding the Mega Man level. Jack actually tuned in for the duration of that live stream and shared a few bits of commentary and added details behind the development of this level. I, he is in the chat. He said uh, he really hopes this level doesn't crash. Of course, that finish line was then pushed further back with the decision made to create a Bobo's Small Adventure. It was also relatively late in development that Roger left for that comedy tour, but these guys knew to take opportunities when they arose. Creating this entire original game is a lot of work to tack on to the end, but they wanted something entirely of their own, building on this world and lore they had created, and serving as something they could use to reward their fans. After donating any amount to this project, they will send you a copy of a Bow Boy's Small Adventure. It was never really for the money. But I mean, each time we exhibited at Comic-Con, that was like over 1500 bucks alone just for, for the booth. So, That's and, what I thought, right? And it's we did that multiple times, and then you got the hotel right. fees and, and everything, so, you know. With a refusal to cut corners, the game spent one final year in development before finally landing on a January 11th, 2012 release date. Roger's pal Brad Webb, a professional editor and producer, helped out by cutting a trailer to hype up the game. There are very few Flash games that ever warranted or received trailers. A Bobo's Big Adventure was definitely worthy of that. To this day, this trailer still gets me so excited. It was kind of a, a blessing in disguise that it took so long because it just built more and more hype. And I remember the, the trailer hitting and that got way more views than I ever expected and like big media, like video game media outlets picked up the trailer and were talking about it and hyping it. Yeah. And that, that yeah, was all unexpected was. to me that it would cross over from like Flash into legit video game world. You know, again, this is, it's still a Flash game. It's a massive Flash game, but you wouldn't really see IGN, uh, even Game Informer magazine and, and places like that, you know, sharing a Flash game uh, at the time. That was just kind of unheard of. After this dropped, diehard fans were heralding a Bobo as game of the year before it even released. That's a lot to live up to. The hype behind this game was huge. Heavy nominated that trailer among their 11 best game trailers of the year. That put it in the same category as Grand Theft Auto V and The Last of Us. Tony Ponce of Destruction Destructoid shared, this is the game that could only exist as an ethereal construct. Yet here is a trailer and a promise of an actual release. I can die a happy man. Caleb Reading from Uproxx assumed it was a fake trailer created to tease a non-existent project. Upon learning it was the real deal, Caleb proceeded to write multiple articles raving about the game, capping it with, it is tremendous, no words, should have sent a poet. Roger worked tirelessly to get people excited for this game, sharing development updates, big announcements, and holiday celebrations all in the voice of a bobo. It's something he just really loved doing and took pride in going that extra mile to really flex his creative and writing muscles. It's hard to really capture the excitement and anticipation that had built up around this project. Your free Flash game doesn't get noticed by the likes of Wired, Game Informer, Destructoid, IGN, and many more without some serious momentum building behind it. Not just the website, mind you. They made it into the literal Game Informer magazine. Roughly 10,000 people signed up for the beta for this totally free game. People were that eager to finally experience a Bobo's big adventure for themselves. Before getting into the release of a Bobo, I'd like to include a dedicated section to a subject that I imagine will fascinate others as much as it does myself. Everyone is aware of how strict Nintendo can be with fan games and how risky using copyrighted characters, assets, and materials can be. Even in this completely transformative format, something completely programmed from scratch is still at risk. Look at a game like Henry Stickman that I've covered at length on the channel. Another project with infinite references piled on top of each other, presented in entirely new and unique ways, and they still had to change most of the sound effects, music, and many art assets when it came time for the Henry Stickman collection. The main reason there being that as soon as the Stickman collection was for sale, they could no longer rely on the protection of parody laws. Your 
directly profiting off the work of others, even if the references themselves are very indirect. Roger, Nick, and Pox were all old school new grounders who remember the Wild West days, as Nick calls them. People uploaded sprite based games and animations all the time. To this day, that's still barely a concern, as even the games rarely act as a replacement to the real deals. Nick described using the actual sprites, in addition to having NES authenticity, was our way of referencing that era of Flash creations. We even have a catch all later on on the Contra level when Kirby pukes up like almost every Nintendo character that ever existed. All the extra characters we couldn't find a place yeah. <laughs> for in the game. The real issue is usually copyright music and effects used in these animations and games. Newgrounds unlisted thousands of old games and animations years ago so they didn't take any more heat for copyright law, something they've had to deal with multiple times. We justify the use of these assets because of our pure love for the material. We aren't trying to damage Nintendo or rip it off for our own gain. In fact, the exact opposite is true. We're trying to pay tribute and write a love letter to our 8-bit child in the best language we know how. To us, using anything less than the original material would have blunted the edge of the experience. For example, would seeing a facsimile of the duck hunt dog getting charred to a crisp be as satisfying as seeing the actual, unmistakable, original, from the game dog be murdered? Would killing some unrecognizable old man instead of the actual old man from Zelda have the same impact? Even though it's free, how it's escaped any major takedowns for its musical inclusions, if nothing else, we know how ruthless the copyright landscape can be, is beyond me. They emailed us, you know, Capcom and, you know, people un unofficially off the record were saying how much they loved it. You know, they just couldn't no promote, way. It, promote no. it publicly or anything like that, of course. And we understand that, you know, because this would be a licensing nightmare for anybody. From an old interview with IGN, Roger added, We've had reps from a variety of companies play the game at Comic-Con, and they always had a smile on their face. So that's always been encouraging. This commitment meant they could never make direct money off selling this game. It couldn't be uploaded to a store, it couldn't have a traditional Flash sponsor or proper game publisher to offset development costs. They started this project knowing full well that they may potentially never make a dime off their work. The fact that they've made anything indirectly off this project is great to hear, and I'll bring it up yet again, I would encourage anyone who has played and enjoyed this game to donate to this team. A Bobo's Big Adventure dropped on January 11th, 2012, 10 years ago. It easily claimed the daily and weekly first prizes on Newgrounds, at one point sitting as the highest rated game of all time, and to this day still ranking among the very best, one spot above the original Binding of Isaac demo. Roger shared a picture of a celebratory cake that his late wife Ree and some friends gave him a decade ago upon the release of a Bobo. Den of Geek wrote a great article on the history of the character of a Bobo, as well as praising Bobo's big adventure in a variety of ways, they draw attention to the fact that 2012 also saw the release of Double Dragon Neon. And they state, of those two 2012 releases, a Bobo's Big Adventure is surprisingly the better game in terms of its portrayal of the big man, as it solidified his status as a nostalgic beat-em-up icon. Over the years, the game has accumulated well over 10 million plays, and that's only counting sources that track those numbers. I already shared that this game won Newgrounds' Game of the Year, but that wasn't its only accolades. Online gaming buff Jay is Games bestowed Best Action Adventure Game of 2012 on a Bobo, plus a nomination for Best Action Game at the Flash Gaming Summit 2013, as well as it being nominated for Destructoid's Community Choice Award, alongside major AAA titles like Borderlands 2, Mass Effect 3, Indie Darling, Journey, with the award eventually going to Telltale's The Walking Dead. Although a Bobo still managed to pick up third place. Pretty impressive. A Bobo's Big Adventure was an instant classic, fan favorite, and was showered with praise from every critic who gave it a shot. While it's easy to revel in the nostalgia and wax poetic about this game, I wanted to instead share 
the praise lavished on Abobo from around the web back upon its release. This is the game you'll be talking about for months to come, the type of game where you feel anything could happen next. The controls are good, the animation is slick, and the game really feels like a project that had a massive amount of time invested in it. It's one of the best Flash games we've played in ages. Playing just like their respective sources, from a mechanical perspective alone, the stages are damn near perfect. Its referential humor is fun and not something that can be found anywhere else. With its massive secrets, cutscenes, unlockables, and achievements, there is a whole heck of a lot of stuff to explore here. Overall, Abobo's Big Adventure is the kind of game that knows it has a target audience and does everything in its power to pander to it. And once more from Tony Ponce, returning to shout this game's name from the rooftops, not just referring to it as the game of the year, but as his game of the forever, recognizing the way it transcended the very games and system that inspired it. All three of these guys are clearly so proud of what they achieved here, and they should be. They can reminisce over nearly every second of the game, remembering some conversation or another that led down a rabbit hole of decision making to the final product we see now. Every single inclusion was handpicked and integrated so lovingly. Nick could have beaten this game in probably about one hour, that stream easily went for four, and we pretty continuously had to remind ourselves to push forward in the level and move on to talking about other things. There is so much to share there. Oh, it was such an honor to be a part of that stream. I hope that in another 10 years, people continue to play this game and can go back to that to reminisce. Nick asked me to include that he has been a longtime speedrunning fanatic, and that it's been a dream ever since a Bobo's Big Adventure came out to see it featured in Games Done Quick. I don't have the specific connections to make that happen. I'm hoping someone watching does or knows how to get that ball rolling. Let's make it happen. Let's see some Abobo speedruns. One thing that I wanted to point out is I watched the world record speedrun of Abobo's Big Adventure. He gets through these without getting hit. Without yeah, getting hit is impressive. Yeah. I've only seen that once before. There's a chance this game could have been completed sooner with a more linear, clearly defined design approach, but I also doubt we'd have moments like a Bobo banging a mermaid and birthing these freaky mutants if they planned it out that far ahead. I'll share one more section of Nick's postmortem to put it all in perspective. In the end, the game wasn't about money. It may seem trite, but it was something inside us that we had to do, a story we had to tell, with characters who wove themselves into our life matter as we were growing up. A Bobo's Big Adventure put me through some very tough times and was one of the hardest things I've ever done. But I think we've made something that might live on as a landmark even in a world that's flooded with video games. As you can tell, it was much more than just three guys making a game. A huge thanks goes to Newgrounds, and especially Tom Fulp for supporting this effort. This community inspired us to push a part of our souls out through our computer mice, digital pens, and fingertips. And while positive fan reception was all these devs could ever really hope for, they got something even bigger that's hard to really imagine. Yoshihisha Kishimoto, the creator of Double Dragon himself, said in an interview with Polygon that he's fully supportive of a Bobo's Big Adventure, and thinks it's a great game. He also shared how particular he is about endorsing fan games. Honestly, the, the biggest compliment that I took from, from all of it, and I mean, there were plenty of amazing things, you know, whether it was, you know, some of our heroes talking about it or whatever, but uh, Yoshihisha Kishimoto, who was the creator of Double Dragon, he was really supportive of it. He thought it was a great game. Wow. And he just said he didn't mind if people made games, you know, with his characters, but he wanted to uphold a certain quality in whatever they're making. And him saying our game was great and that he was supportive of it, I mean, that, that oh pretty my much, God. That, that, that did it for me. He recognized the love, attention to detail, and commitment to authenticity of the product, holding it above other Double Dragon fan games for staying true to the source in their own unique way. And finally, to round out the video, I can talk about a Bobo's Super Adventure. This is the sequel that never was. A game that never made it much further than the earliest possible stages of development and pre-planning. This is the first time the team has ever actually confirmed a Bobo's Super Adventure ever existed. And the few bits I have to share are exclusive looks at this ambitious project. I asked a few key questions, and we'll be using Roger's responses to detail what this game could have been. 
After 10 years, I think we all needed some time away from a Bobo before we were ready to dive back in. We wanted to enjoy seeing people having fun with a Bobo's big adventure rather than immediately starting on another a Bobo game. Pox and I started making some games for Adult Swim in 2013, Bionic Chainsaw Pogo Gorilla, and Godball, while Nick was working on other things. So the Super a Bobo's Big Adventure game wasn't up for serious discussion again until somewhere in 20. 2015 if memory serves. The team knew this time around they would lean into the parody angle, creating 100% original assets with the only copyrighted character being a Bobo. Roger was actively in the process of licensing a Bobo so he could be used officially, but it was moving so slowly. And then the rights holders at the time, before a Bobo and friends had new owners who would make good use of the IP, wanted an exorbitant amount of money. But uh, it was a company in Japan and they were traditional business. Like I was literally having to fax them because they, they did not use email. They would not use email. You had to do business with them the traditional way and it was kind of ridiculous. So that kind of killed that whole project off. And we could just tell the juice wasn't going to be worth the squeeze. The ownership of a Bobo and all did change uh, later on and my buddy Ben and Rudis actually got to make games with a Bobo. The River City Rampage remakes and River City Girls. Uh, a Bobo, since we've made that game, has actually appeared in quite a number of games and uh, I'm glad you know that we could get him to be popular enough to to do that so it's and he cool seeing that. Has a mustache. Yeah, he does and that is because of us. We had Are long discussions. Serious? What? We had long discussions about whether that was a scowl or a mustache and we we're like it's both. It's going to be both. So <laughs> um so so the, the good news is, is if we ever decide to revisit a Bobo ourselves to make an official game, I now actually have, you know, good communication with, with the, you know, people who know the real rights holders now and all that. And I've, I've been told before that it would not be an issue getting the rights to a Bobo again uh, to, to make the game. With I can't believe so, you changed the face of a Bobo, um, literally and metaphorically. Yeah. At least someone out there is doing things to positively reinforce the appearance of this character. <laughs> so ugly. No. <laughs> That lovely bit of art house filmmaking comes to us from up and coming director and voice actor Nicholas Pasto. Actually, though, it's just a dumb little video he threw up on the official Abobo YouTube channel. But for real, the mustache is now canon because of these guys. Abobo is the principal in River City Rumble Underground, and in the background, we can see him riding around on Falcor and punching a rhinoceros. Direct friends of the developers worked on that game and made sure to pay homage back to a Bobo's big adventure. We started working on a number of concepts for a replacement to Bobo character, such as the blue snaggletooth monster with mashing blocks for hands instead of fists, but nothing ever really caught on with the three of us. And from Pox, I have this named as Stumpo in my files. Basically, just drew a bunch of mutated Domo-kuns to try and make a game with an original character of some sort. At one point, they even considered making a Bow boy the star of the game, since he was technically an original character character. Same as the first Abobo, the team had started discussing some of the various levels and game tributes they would want to include. We were mainly discussing what games we wanted to have as stages. The one thing we knew for certain was we were going to start off with a Final Fight style fighting game. I had also mocked up a shot of Abobo riding in Mario Kart, because with games like Super Mario Kart and F-Zero, we knew we had to make a level like that if we were going to pay homage to the 16-bit era. And while while it likely would have taken on a stream of consciousness development style again, something they were all more than comfortable with now. There were a few assets and mockups created for a design doc to pitch the game to a Bobo's rights holders. This included a Bobo cart, ghouls in a Boboblins, teenage mutant ninja Bobos, and a Bow type. 
Since there's no actual Abobo's Super Adventure footage to share, I'll instead include gameplay from those official Super Nintendo games as well as other popular games from that system. And over that, I'll read off the story outline from that design document. After the events of Abobo's Big Adventure, Abobo started destroying all the new video games that development teams were working on in the mid-1990s. Abobo was just this unstoppable, angry force ruining all their work so all the companies decided to band together and agreed something had to be done. What they did was install a special chip in the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis systems, and when enough of those systems were simultaneously powered on, they were collectively able to keep Abobo in a digital prison, preventing him from causing any further damage to the video game industry. However, they didn't think ahead that one day those systems would no longer constantly be played by millions of people around the world, that those systems would eventually begin to collect dust. When this happened, Abobo broke free of his digital confinements and now he's setting out to destroy all those worlds from the 16-bit era of video games. This also included an overview of the general gameplay. As with the previous game, every stage in Abobo's super adventure will be a completely different type of game. Players will start out with a classic beat-em-up stage and then progress through other stages which emulate anything from Metroid and Castlevania to Super Mario Kart and R-Type and many more. Just like the first game, we will have increasingly large boss fights at the end of each stage along with all new rage attacks for Abobo to use against his enemies. Roger claims that Pox likely put the most time into this new project, crafting that final fight mock-up, as well as the SNES promo image. Pox actually dusted off an old folder to see what else there was to share. He has some ripped sprites he was using for color, style, and animation frame reference. He even had some very early tile work started. The goal was for most objects to be either destructible or available to throw and use as weapons. Making all the artwork for a Super Nintendo style game on the scale of the first Abobo would be a full-time job for probably a few years. It's probably five to ten times the work that Abobo was. That's what it would be without reskinning any sprites, backgrounds, and just drawing everything from scratch. With an entirely new asset, batch every new level, cutscene, etc. It'd basically be one man doing a Metal Slug game. At this point, Roger actually chimed in. Another thing I forgot, we also had my buddy Bannon Rudis agreeing to be our second artist on the project. So I guess it would be like two people making a Metal Slug game by themselves? Yeah, still a lot of work. As I've highlighted numerous times, it's incredible the work this team put into a Bobo knowing they would never see any meaningful monetary returns. That's incredible to do once and borderline insane to do twice. So the goal with a licensed a Bobo and parody characters was always to sell it as a full game. We had so many people asking for a Bobo's big adventure on their favorite console Steam, etc. It just made sense to make an official game, but we also had bills to pay and couldn't do another 10-year project without making some cash. Also, if it was a paying project, we planned on crowdfunding it at the time, we could focus on it full-time and finish it much faster. After all, a big reason Abobo took so many years to complete is we were all working on it in our spare time while we worked other jobs. Eventually, the team reconvened and instead prioritized working on another dream project, the the entirely original IP, Barf Barians. Roger detailed how immediate and strong player reactions were just from seeing the animated title screen alone. This was intended to be a local multiplayer beat-em-up, with the lead Barf Barian known as Herlo. Roger just like writing stuff down in words on a page and then us having to like figure out what that looks like because he's just like, oh yeah, it's a beat-em-up but all their attacks are made of vomit. And you're like, <laughs> what? how does that look yep. like? This project has been shelved with Roger working full-time on Cyanide and Happiness's Freak Apocalypse trilogy starting back in 2017. But projects like Abobo and Barf Barians have never left his thoughts. I've never lost sight of Barf Barians and really want to come back to it. All that said, I'd still gladly work on a new Abobo game again in the future. Despite the daunting nature of the project and all the pitfalls of a lengthy 
production, we had so many laughs during the creation of it. And hey, who knows, maybe a Bobo could show up to make a cameo in Barfbarians. I can't imagine how powerful a Bobo's barf, a Bo barf, would be. Barfbarians! 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 Talking with just about any other team, I would say all these ideas seem overly ambitious, but they've directly proven to us that they can do it, even without any sort of monetary motivator. That is just so mind-blowing, and I'm so hopeful that someday this core team of three is able to come back together to work on one of their many dream projects. You know, absolutely work with Nick and Poxy. I mean, they're, they're two of my favorite guys. Uh, they're my brothers, uh, and so uh, we we had a lot of fun doing those games, and uh, Pox and I did make some more games afterwards. Uh, Nick was working on some other projects at the time and stuff uh, when Pox and I started doing a couple games for Adult Swim and all that. Uh, but it was just one of those things, the timing was, was bad. Nick is still forever one of my favorite programmers and one of my favorite people. So uh, at one point, we, we tried starting up on a new game that I am absolutely determined to uh, make see the light of day someday, and that is Barth Barians. And with that, we have a complete look at the 10-year legacy and 20-year history of Abobo's big adventure, including even crazier projects that this dream game may someday lead to. Abobo was completed against all odds, driven entirely by the efforts of a small group of enthusiastic individuals, creating the game they felt the NES deserved and that the world needed. It has been an absolute joy to research this project and to be granted the honor of hosting that anniversary live stream meant so much to me. I already love all things Flash related, and I am a sucker for anything that takes this dedicated love letter route, taking the time to pack in small references for the select few who will appreciate them all. But on top of that, a Bobo has actually exposed me to a history of gaming I previously knew very little about. When I was born in the early 90s, we already had the Super Nintendo, and my exposure to the original was extremely limited. So thank you to the Abobo team for their history lessons and education via this big adventure. And I hope that this video has opened similar doors of intrigue for viewers and that everyone can appreciate the insane amount of work that went into this game. Thank you once again to the Abobo team. I had no idea I'd be making a nearly feature-length documentary when starting this video, but I'm so damn proud of how it came together. I'm proud of all of my Flashlight videos, happily sharing some interesting bits of Flash gaming history and internet culture along the way, but I think I've really set a new bar with this one. I know I'm patting myself on the back, like, quite hard here, but a video of this size felt almost necessary, reaching to match a proportion level of effort that this team put into a Bobo's big adventure. Thank you all so much for watching, thank you to patrons of the channel for their additional support, and I hope to see you all again soon.